Now, another concept related to the law of projection, which I just presented at the top of the page, is that the localization of a particular sensation is always projected back to the site where that particular sensory pathway originated. And you might be thinking, what the hell does that mean? All right, so let me, uh, I'm going to read this again in just a few minutes, but I'm going to give you a clinical example of what this means. And the clinical example I'm going to give you is phantom limb. Oh. Phantom limb. And it's on the next page. On page 83, who's heard of phantom limb? All right, so phantom limb is where, as I wrote here, after somebody has had an arm or a leg amputated, they still feel that they have that arm or a leg there. And of course, you're thinking, well, can't they see they don't have the arm anymore? Yes, they see they don't have an arm, but in their mind, they feel that arm is still there. And they can feel uh, temperature and pain and sensations coming from that phantom arm that's no longer there. So this is called phantom limb phenomenon. This is really an example of what that statement said on the bottom of the previous page. Um, let me, before I explain this whole phenomenon, uh, when I talk about amputations, so most of us are thinking, yeah, you know, like soldiers, you know, in a war, they injure an arm or a leg and it has to be amputated. Well, that's true. But the most common reason for amputating, removing an arm or a leg is diabetes. diabetes. And if you know of anybody who has had chronic, severe diabetes for many, many, many years, one of the side effects of having chronic, uncontrolled, unmanaged diabetes is poor circulation to the extremities, to the arms and legs. And over time, the poor circulation of ox delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the arms or legs results in the, them developing infections, and becoming necrotic, that means the tissue starts to die, and in basically uh, they have to amputate the arm or leg that's becoming necrotic, it's dying. So uh, that's the most common reason for amputation. So in case you're thinking, oh yeah, just people you know who've been in war, that's not the most common reason why people have amputations. All right, now, uh, the reason that what creates the phantom limb phenomenon is I wrote that there are severed sensory nerve endings in the stump that generate impulses that are interpreted as originating from the amputated limb. Now, you have a picture here, but I've learned over the years that if I give you a larger picture, uh, students seem to understand it better. So I'm going to pass, uh, pass the same thing out, just bigger. So uh, here's what we want you to uh, remember. We've talked about, thank you, we've talked about the neural pathway for sensation. Does anybody remember how many neurons does it take to send a signal from anywhere in your body to the cerebral cortex? Three neurons. All right? Only takes two neurons to send a signal from your cerebral cortex to a skeletal muscle. That's the motor pathway, but it takes three neurons typically to send a signal from anywhere in your body to your cerebral cortex. So we've talked about that, we've seen pictures of that, and that's what this picture is showing. Let's identify those three neurons. It shows sensory neurons originating in the foot. Right? Do you have sensory neurons in your feet? Can you feel sensations from your toes and feet? Yeah. So it shows one sensory neuron. Do you only have one sensory neuron from your foot? You've got millions of them, millions of them. All right, so they're traveling up your leg, and they synapse in the spinal cord. Where is the cell body of these sensory neurons? It's located in the dorsal root ganglion of the spinal nerve. We've seen pictures. You've drawn a picture on page 66A. The cell body of all sensory neurons 
from uh, throughout your body are, are located in the dorsal root ganglion, right near the spinal cord. All right, so uh, it synapses onto the second neuron in this sequence. The second neuron in the sequence is always a myelinated interneuron that typically uh, sends the signal to the thalamus of the brain. That's where most uh, sensory information goes. There are exceptions, but that's where most of it goes, right here. And there, in the thalamus of the brain, this second neuron synapses onto a third order neuron, the third uh, neuron in the sequence, it's typically myelinated, that sends the signal to the primary sensory area. Because that's the area of your brain in the uh, parietal lobe of the cerebral cortex that receives most sensory information about touch and vibration and temperature and pain and proprioception. All right, so that's the neural pathway. Now, normally, of course, if you tickle somebody's toe, that activates signals, and it goes to a specific area in the primary sensory area. We just showed you, no, no, in the cerebral cortex. We just showed you a map on the uh, uh, previous page of where information from your legs goes to the very top of the primary sensory area. That was that little brain picture, right? So we know exactly where the signals from your legs go to, uh, your feet go to the top of the primary sensory area. Um, so normally, you, you tickle somebody, the signal goes right there. Now, uh, what if we just activated an impulse right here and it still went to that same area? the person would say, oh, I feel a sensation coming from my toe. Now, we, it did the signal, we didn't tickle the person's toe, but we stimulated this neuron, and it activated that very same area in the primary sensory area that normally, normally receives information from the foot. So it would create a sensation of uh, something, somebody touching or tickling his foot. What if we uh, just directly stimulate the neurons right in that top of the primary sensory area. He's going to feel sensation as if somebody's touching his foot. Because normally, <laughs> when these neurons in the primary sensory area are activated, they project the sensation originating where that sensory pathway or, nor, originated. It's like That's a, how it interprets it. Even if it's not there. You can stimulate that brain. And in that, if stimulating, just showing you the picture again, if you stimulate this part of the primary sensory area, right there, the person will say, I feel sensations from my legs. It's like a person because that's the... where it normally receives information from the legs. All right? The person doesn't say, oh, you're stimulating my brain. The person's going to say, I feel sensations of touch and temperature coming from my legs. Nope. This is the way we're wired. Because obviously the reason why your brain does perceive it that way is because normally, normally, that is the way those neurons are activated. I was just thinking in post-traumatic stress, I thought there would, there would probably be some type of signal that go up to that. This is the way we're wired. So normally what would activate those neurons at the top of the primary sensory area are signals coming from the foot. And the fact that now we're just directly stimulating them, your brain doesn't say, oh, now I know what's happening. It doesn't. It still assumes or projects. The sensation still feels like it's coming from the foot. Yep? Is that similar like sometimes like, like put yourself on the top of the head and you can like feel it like in the lower front? Yes, that's possible. If you are wow. struck, now we've learned. It's like a hernia disc. Now, uh, the, well, could be. We, if, this is the primary visual area. If you hit somebody at the back of their head, here's the common English expression, see stars. seeing stars. Yeah. It's they see a flash of light. Because when you activate these neurons, it creates a visual sensation. And if you were struck on the side of the head, you might hear ringing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You'll hear sounds. Because that's how these neurons always, when oh, they're activated, that's that that's creates the sensation. <laughs> All right? So. It's Here, like uh, yeah. a disc, people will complain about legs before the legs. Absolutely, because that's where the sensory neurons are yeah, originating yeah, from. Hurting my leg. So, let's imagine somebody has their leg amputated. It really doesn't matter whether it was amputated at the <laughs> ankle, 
at the calf, at the knee, or even at the thigh. It's really not going to matter. When they, when they amputate, you now have a raw stump. It's inflamed. It's raw. And that inflammation is activating impulses in these sensory neurons. And they're sending signals up to the brain, creating a sensation in the person's mind of, I feel sensations coming from my foot. I can feel it. I feel uh, pain. I feel temperature. I feel uh, all kinds of sensations. My leg is there. Yes, can they look down and see they don't have a leg? Yes, they, I don't have a leg, but I feel it. I feel sensations coming from my leg. Because these signals going from the raw stump are going up to that area of the cerebral cortex. So, again, what is the cerebral cortex doing? It's projecting the sensation that it, you're, it's creating. The sensation that's being created is projected, is originating where that sensory pathway normally originates. That's what I wrote. Let's reread it on the bottom of page 82. So what did I write? The particular sensation is always projected back to the site, to the location where that sensory pathway originated. Yep. So it's telling that if they give him a plastic limb or something, will he able to... No, you don't feel the play. You can't feel it. You have some, no sensory neurons in, your, in that uh, plastic foot. Yeah. This is just a, in their mind. All of this is in their mind. It has nothing to do with the foot. They have no foot. Now, in terms of this phantom limb phenomenon, it usually goes away after a three to six months. Because what happens is, as the stump hardens and the inflammation subsides, it stops activating these neurons. Now remember, when we, these neurons were sending impulses, remember the cell body is still alive. It's still a totally functional neuron. This is the cell body of the neuron. So, but eventually the stump hardens the swelling, the inflammation subsides, and it stops activating impulses and all these neurons going up to the brain. So his sensation of that phantom le leg is starting to go away. And that's usually what happens. All right, so this is understanding how our brain is wired. Now, uh, at the bottom of page uh, 83, the bottom of page 83, I want to speak a little bit about pain. And in my opinion, of all the senses that you have, vision, hearing, smell, uh, a taste, and so on, touch, the most important is pain. Because pain is informing you something is seriously wrong. And if something, that's what brings people to the hospital. That's what takes, sends them to the doctor. That certainly is what causes them to see a dentist, is they're in pain. Okay, most people don't say, you know, I feel great. I think I'll see my dentist. <laughs> they might have their teeth cleaned by the hygienist, but they don't want to see a dentist. You mentioned, you know, if you ask people to do a word association, you say dentist, they say pain. Isn't that right? Yeah. All right? There's only one thing that will make somebody want to see a dentist. They are in so much pain, they're willing to even see the dentist. All right? So uh, pain is very, very important. Uh, what is it? It's an unpleasant sensation associated with suffering. It is the only sensation that has a built-in emotion. This is the only sensation that has a built-in emotion of suffering, of anguish. In other words, if I were, if I projected the color blue, all right, so would we all agree emotionally of what blue means to us? No, some of us would say, you know, I really like blue. Other people would say, you know, I like red or I like yellow better. So we would not all agree on the feeling or sensation, you know, what we think about the color blue. All right? If we played music, right? If we played classical music, we played rap music, we played Dixieland music, would we all agree? Would we all experience the same emotion? No. No. Some of us like this kind of music. Some of us like a different kind of music. All right, how about taste, right? Some of us like spicy, some of us don't like spicy, right? So we can't agree on taste. How about smells? Some people say, you know, I think gardenia is the best smell. Some people say, no, jasmine's the best smell. Others say, no, roses are the best smell. So we can't agree on smells. We feel differently about it. There's only one sensation 
we all agree with. We don't like pain. What about pleasure? Huh? What about pleasure? What causes pleasure varies in people. The only thing that we can agree on with unanimity is none of us want pain. You start creating pain, people say, stop it, stop it, stop it. We all say that. It is the only sensation that has a built-in, consistent emotion. Some people are addicted to pain. Yeah, not, are, are they considered normal? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> if, they're, if they want pain, there's something wrong with them, because all normal people try to avoid pain. All right, now, let's recall how, what activates the pain pathway. It begins with injury to cells. The injured cells release chemicals, including kinins and prostaglandins. So, like, do we have to know those chemicals? Yes. And uh, those chemicals activate the NOx receptors, which are chemoreceptors, uh, and they send signals to the thalamus and limbic system. Have we mentioned the limbic system? Feelings. Center of emotions. So that's where the suffering kicks in. And then the signal goes to the cerebral cortex. Let's uh, uh, take a look at uh, pain in more detail on the next page. So on the uh, top of page 84, top of page 84, it shows a needle sticking into the skin. Here's the pain sensory neuron. According to the picture is the needle sticking into the sensory, pain sensory neuron. Does it show it sticking into the pain sensory neuron? No. Now it could, the needle could have been sticking right into the pain sensory neuron, but that's not how it's normally activated. What normally activates the pain sensory neuron are chemicals released, cannons and prostaglandins released from the injured cells. Pain sensory neurons are chemoreceptors. They are normally activated by chemicals released from injured cells. Now, let's take a look at the pain pathway. And the pain pathway, pain pathway follows the pattern, that, uh, the typical pattern that we've uh, learned about uh, several times. Now, I'm, I'm going to go through this uh, uh, pain pathway. Uh, as I said, I've discovered over the years that if you draw a bigger picture, students uh, like it better. So in fact, I think on the next page, uh, most of you should have uh, page uh, 84A. And it's simply the same picture that we saw, just bigger. Is there anybody who doesn't have this? Everybody got it? All right, so uh, let's go through the uh, neural pathway for pain. Incidentally, this would be a great essay question, the whole subject of pain, because pain is really important. All right, so uh, let's uh, just start here. And we're going to deal with pain. And pain is pain. It doesn't matter if you've injured your finger or you've injured your tooth, because pain is pain. So let's start with injury to a finger first. All right, so it shows uh, a tack in somebody's finger. And this is the pain sensory neuron. What do we call pain sensory neuron? A noxiceptor or nociceptor. That's the first order neuron, the first neuron in a series of three in the neural pathway. Now, is the tack necessarily sticking right into a pain sensory neuron? No, because in fact, it probably isn't. What normally activates a pain sensory neuron is not a tack sticking into it, but chemicals. It is a chemoreceptor activated by kinins and prostaglandins released by injured cells. Now, uh, here's the cell body of this pain sensory neuron, and it's shown synapsing in the spinal cord onto a myelinated inner neuron in the dorsal gray horn area. All right? So the cell body of this pain sensory neuron is located in the dorsal root ganglion. That's where these sensory neuron cell bodies are. All right, the, it uh, synapses onto this myelinated uh, inner neuron, which is the second neuron in this series. And what is this myelinated inner neuron doing right here? Decussating. It's decussating. It's crossing to the other side. Yep. So if this happened to be, let's say, your right hand, this signal is going to go to the left side of your brain. So it enters the, it decussates, enters the white matter, and it's set, uh, as seen uh, ascending, sending a signal vertically upwards, up, 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 
And where does it synapse? Right here in an area called the thalamus. And right near the thalamus, as we'll be learning, is the limbic system, the center of emotions. There, this second order neuron, and this neuron that's sending a signal about pain or temperature from the spinal cord up to the thalamus is part of a bundle of millions of myelinated neurons called the spinothalamic tract, which we've talked about. So the spinothalamic tract is a bundle of millions of myelinated neurons sending information uh, about temperature or pain from all over your body up to the thalamus. So it's shown synapsing in the thalamus onto the third neuron in this sequence. So it activates this third neuron. This is a myelinated neuron, and it sends the signal to the primary sensory area. Where's the primary sensory area? In the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe of the cerebral cortex. And there it will go to a specific area in the primary sensory area that normally receives sensations, information from the hand, which is a slightly different place than the area that receives uh, information from the foot or from the face. All right, so does everybody follow the neural pathway for pain? from what, uh, whether it's the finger, whether it's a foot, whether it's a leg, it follows this pattern. Now, what about the tooth or anything from the face? So we have talked about the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve number five. The trigeminal nerve has millions of sensory neurons within it sending sensations from the entire face, including the teeth, to the brain. So uh, let's imagine somebody has a, 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 an injury to the tooth. You say, yeah, like what? OK, I'll be very specific. They, their pulp cavity is all infected. You'd say, what's that mean? They need a root canal. We don't want to know. Has anybody ever had a root canal? Yeah. All right, so if you had a root canal, did you have pain? Yeah. You had so much pain, you begged to see the dentist. So when you called the, your dentist to make an appointment and they said, we could see you in a week, you said, can't they see me sooner? Is that right? You never had a root canal. OK. It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. All right? Who had a root canal? All right? Did, did you want to see a dentist as soon as possible? Yes. That's how pleasant it is. All right? So this is really now. So it's all infected. Does infections, uh, is that associated with injured cells? Yeah. That's, you've got a bacterial infection in the pulp cavity. So if cells are being injured, they are releasing kinins and prostaglandins that are activating these pain sensory neurons. These pain sensory neurons are in the trigeminal nerve. That's the cable containing all these sensory neurons from the face. The uh, cell body of these sensory neurons is in an area called the semilunar ganglion. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to know it. But if you're interested in dentistry or dental hygiene, I'm going to show you a picture in just a moment to show you where it is exactly. But I won't ask the rest of the class to know. Anyhow, this pain sensory neuron and, and sensory neurons in general from the face synapse in the brainstem. After all, the cranial nerves are connected to your brainstem, the cranial nerves. And so it synapses in an area in the brainstem called the trigeminal nucleus which just means trigeminal center. Nucleus means center. So, uh, and that's a good, easy term to remember, because after all, these are sensory neurons contained in the trigeminal nerve. So they synapse in the trigeminal nucleus of the brainstem. This sensory neuron, this first order neuron, synapses onto the second neuron in this sequence. What does this second neuron do? It's a myelinated neuron. It does what? It decussates. And it travels vertically upward, not very far, up to the thalamus. So this second order neuron right here is also considered to be part of the spinothalamic tract. You'd say, but it didn't come originate from the spinal cord. It originated here in the brain stem. I know, but it's still sending information about pain and temperature to the thalamus. So it's part of that same bundle of wires communicating information about pain to the thalamus. So it's part of the spinothalamic tract bundle. Remember, there's not just one or two, as shown in this picture. There are millions of them. 
All right? So it's synapses in the thalamus, which is linked to the limbic system associated with emotion. It synapses onto a third neuron in the sequence that sends the signal to the primary sensory area in the parietal lobe of the cerebral cortex, slightly different place than the sensations, uh, the information from the hand, which would be slightly different from information from the legs. So each of these goes to a slightly different place in the primary sensory area. All right, so the neural pathway for pain whether it's pain from the face or pain from a hand or a leg is very, very similar. Let's uh, go back to uh, the previous page, 84, and talk about the treatment of pain. So, wait a second, um, Professor. So the thalamus is like extremely busy, huh? The, the, almost <laughs> all sensory information goes to the thalamus. We're going to have more to say about it. All right, now, uh, I've given you, just to make this more clinically interesting, so I've given you three pharmacologic approaches to controlling pain. Do you think controlling pain is going to be an important subject for you, clinically? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Do you know what the most common medications that people buy over the counter? Pain. Yeah, pain medications. Whether it's Tylenol or whether it's Advil, whether it's aspirin, whether it's Motrin. Whatever it is, whether it's a leave, people buy pain medications, okay? Because we all have our aches and pains, and we're constantly taking stuff. So this is the most common of medications purchased over the counter. All right, uh, the, uh, we're going to deal with three different approaches to uh, pain, and two of the three we've already t learned about, and the third one we've alluded to. So the first approach uh, to control the pain is the using aspirin or Tylenol or Advil. Do so you remember how, what they do? Yeah, they block the enzyme. Yeah, yeah. They block an enzyme that forms prostaglandins. Mm. <clears throat> All right? So they stop injured cells from releasing prostaglandins. And if prostaglandins are not being released from injured cells, there will be less activation of the pain sensory neurons. So they all work the same? They all work the same. Even Tylenol? They all work the same. Right? So, uh, let's be clear on this. Right? True or false? <laughs> True or false? Tylenol acts on the nervous system. False. Tylenol is acting, in this case, on the injured cells. It's affecting injured cells, not your nervous system. It stopped the injured cells from releasing a chemical that would have activated a pain sensory neuron. But it's not, the Tylenol is not a drug acting on the sensory neuron. It's acting on the injured cells. All right? Now, another approach, do we ever talk about Tylenol before? Yeah. Yes. yes. Back in section uh, uh, C, originally A and in C. Mm -hmm. All right, now, so this is the third time I'm talking about it. Uh, another drug we've talked about uh, uh, previously is uh, uh, the local anesthetics. Uh, xylocaine is a brand name for lidocaine. Lidocaine is a, one of the most commonly used uh, local anesthetics. So local anesthetics temporarily block the conduction of action potentials in excitable cells. So they block the conduction of action potentials in nerve cells, even muscle cells, even heart muscle cells. We had said that before. So um, in the case of uh, using a local anesthetic, they might give an injection into the finger. That, and this lidocaine would stop impulses from being sent, transmitted along this pain sensory neuron. What does the dentist do? The dentist, or the dental hygienist, gives an injection into the mouth to block the conduction of nerve impulses in these sensory neurons in the trigeminal nerve, the branches of the trigeminal nerve. So they're blocking temporarily the conduction of impulses. <clears throat> All right, so that's a, uh, 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 that does affect the nerve cells. That's how it works. All right, now the third approach, which we've alluded to but haven't spoken of explicitly, is the action of morphine and other narcotic pain relievers. Now, there are a whole bunch of narcotic pain relievers. Morphine, heroin, which is illegal, uh, Vicodin, Oxycontin, codeine, not Valium. That's not a narcotic analgesic. Not Valium, that's what he said. No. All right? So there are a whole bunch of these. 
So uh, how do they work? They actually are mimetics of endorphin neurotransmitters. Remember that? Yeah, we did talk about it, page 62. All right, so we had learned on page 62 that endorphins are natural neurotransmitters that do what? Do they excite or inhibit neurons? Endorphins. They inhibit. We listed them as inhibitory neurotransmitters on page 62. And so they cause us to feel relaxed, even a little sleepy, euphoric. all right? Relaxed, euphoric. And uh, they're normally, uh, endorphins are normally released like after an orgasm, people feel relaxed, they even go to sleep. Uh, the, uh, they're released uh, with a runner's high and so on. But we know that the uh, duration of, uh, of this effect of, it, of these uh, endorphin neurotransmitters is very short because they're released and then the enzymes break them down and it's over. So what morphine and codeine and hydrocodone and oxycodone and all these other narcotic drugs do is they activate those endorphin receptor sites for hours. So for hours you're feeling very relaxed <laughs> and sleepy and good. And so uh, that's why they can become addict, very addicting, because imagine feeling very relaxed and good for hours. <clears throat> So, because it, it takes hours for the natural enzymes to break it down. So, uh, it, when people are all taking morphine, when they're taking codeine, when they're taking Vicodin, the, uh, in fact, you're so relaxed, you, it's really hard to stay awake. They really knock you out. Okay? That's why they tell you not to drive cars or something like that when you're on a narcotic, because it's hard to stay awake. So, uh, it's inhibiting, it's slowing down electrical activity. And where does it work? in the thalamus and limbic system. So that's where it's slowing down electrical activity in the thalamus and in the limbic system. Well, since the limbic system is the center of emotions where you're experiencing this pain, this suffering, can you imagine then that it's going to alleviate or reduce this level of suffering and, uh, and uh, pain? Yeah. All right, so that's how it's working. So this drug, these drugs are acting in your brain in the thalamus and limbic system. Now, it's very common, it's very likely that if you had a root canal procedure, it's very likely that all three of these approaches were used in dentistry. During the dental procedure, the dentist gave you an injection of local anesthetic, like lidocaine. That temporarily blocked the conduction of impulses from your mouth. <laughs> And then because they knew that it's a pretty severe procedure that they may have done, so they may have given you a prescription for Tylenol with codeine or a prescription of Vicodin. Vicodin, just like Tylenol with codeine, is a narcotic hydrocodone with Tylenol. That's what Vicodin is. So it's very much like uh, Tylenol with codeine is Vicodin. It's a combination. This is very commonly done where they combine two different drugs to reduce, to actually get a synergistic <laughs> effect, an additive or synergistic effect. You'd say, what do you mean? So when you're taking Tylenol with codeine, the Tylenol is doing what? Is it, a, what's it affecting? Enzymes. It's, yeah, okay, so it's affecting the injured cells, turning off that enzyme that forms prostaglandins. But d now, is the Tylenol going to stop all the activation of the pain sensory neurons? No. No, no why not? It just only stops the prostaglandins. It only stops the prostaglandins. I told you there are two chemicals that activate pain sensory neurons, and they're kinins. <coughs> so the, the Tylenol didn't stop the release of kinins. So that will still activate some uh, impulses in pain sensory neurons, and the signals are still going to go up to your brain. But that's okay. They gave you also a narcotic. And that narcotic is going to inhibit, slow down neural processing in the thalamus of the brain. So any impulses that made it up here are going to be inhibited up here. Now the reason why they like combining these is because by reducing the activation of impulses here in the injured area, they don't have to give you as much of the narcotic because they're using two different effects to reduce pain. 
if they hadn't given you the Tylenol, then it would require a higher dose of the narcotic to work centrally. Because then all the impulses would be going up and you have to use a higher dose to inhibit all those impulses through making it up to the thalamus. So it's very, this is the, commonly the way they, in medicine, they use all these different approaches. So this is a, uh, you know, to understand the pain pathway, to understand the treatment of pain, all of you, no matter which clinical field you're going to be going into, you're going to be seeing patients taking not only uh, these non-narcotic pain relievers like Tylenol and aspirin and Advil, you're going to be seeing the use of narcotics like codeine and Vicodin, uh, hydrocodone and Oxycontin and uh, Percocet and so on. Percocet is uh, also like, it's uh, actually uh, oxycodone with uh, a sediment of the Tylenol. So they commonly com combine these. Yep? Uh, for the people that say that uh, ibuprofen does not treat them, what's the difference? Uh, well, if, uh, if, uh, there's, all, there's lots of them. They would try a lead naproxen. naproxen. There's, there's hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. Right, so, you know, you, you know, your memorizing days are not over. You're going to be memorizing drugs. You know, there's lots of drugs. Why don't they stop the canines, too? Huh? Why don't they stop the other chemicals, the canines? Uh, they, uh, they have, um, and we've naturally mentioned, they have something that will stop the release of all of them. That's the steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, yeah. But they have a lot of serious adverse effects. Yeah. So they could give, you know, you, if somebody has, let's say, chronic pain in their shoulder, their jaw, KMJ, they'll give an injection of, quote, cortisone. And that will not really knock out everything, all the pain, for, at least for a while. So they stop what they're allergic. They block off everything. Well, it, what it's, it's not blocking that. It's blocking the release of all these uh, chemicals released from the injured cells. So it stops the release of all, all, all these prostaglandins, kinins, leukotrienes, histamines, everything. But they only give that like once every three, three months. Well, again, it's, I don't want to get into a whole subject of medicine. You've got a lot to cover. We try to make this class as much of a medicine as we can. But uh, they have a whole, all kinds of different array of drugs to use, and they have to decide what's the most appropriate thing, and not to give somebody propofol. <laughs> I knew you were going to say it. Yeah, you knew I was going to say that. All right, so you have to use the right one. And incidentally, there's a lot of emphasis in medicine and dentistry in what are called following recognized protocols. You know what a protocol is? This is what you're supposed to do. This is the standard that medicine uses. When you start going outside a normal protocol, all the liability is on you. I've talked about that before. So you learn all kinds of standard protocols that are generally accepted in medicine and dentistry, and as long as you're doing what is widely accepted as the rule, even when taken into court, they will simply say, they will get other experts to say they were following what would be the standard of medical care that was commonly done. You can't be sued in that case. You were simply following the normal protocol. All right. Uh, the, uh, now, let's uh, move on to, uh, on page 88, the very uh, 81, 84B, which is right after that big picture of the neural pathway for pain. You don't have to know of anything on this picture, but if you're interested in uh, dentistry or dental hygiene, uh, this, uh, this is the trigeminal nerve. There's that three branches. Inside it are millions of sensory neurons uh, sending information to your brain from your entire face, including uh, the upper and lower teeth. And uh, these sensory neurons, the cell bodies, are located right here in an area uh, called the semilunar ganglion. And then these sensory neurons synapse uh, in the what's called the trigeminal nucleus in the brainstem. All right. So uh, I, I, you don't have to know this, but if you're trying to visualize how what this looks, there is a physical reality to all this. Uh, okay. On page 85. On page 85, the last uh, thing I want to mention about pain is referred pain. And uh, there is a, we talked about this last time, a, a significant difference between uh, pain felt, pain coming from our surface of our body, our skin or skeletal muscles, uh, and pain coming from an internal organ. We said that, we had said last time, if we blindfolded you and put a pin in one of your fingers, 
We asked, do you think you'd know which finger we had stuck the pin into or yeah. were pinching your finger? Definitely. Absolutely. If you don't believe me, we'll try it. All right? But when you have injury to an, coming from an internal organ, it's hard to know exactly which internal organ it is. So while we feel pain, we cannot pinpoint exactly where that pain is coming from. It's called referred pain. So here, the, the example we gave you before, and I wrote it up here, is that myocardial ischemia. What's ischemia? Lack of oxygen. Lack of oxygen to the heart muscle, myocardial heart muscle, creates a pain in your shoulder, your left shoulder called angina pectoris. This picture shows it. Here it says the heart. And when the pain is coming from the heart, you actually feel the pain in the entire left shoulder radiating down the medial side of the left arm. So it, it, you don't even actually even feel the pain. You don't say, oh, that's my heart. So people will just say, wow, I'm getting this pain in my shoulder. Wow. So they don't even necessarily know what it is. So uh, uh, they're, uh, the, look at the, where the pain from the appendix is felt. In other words, the appendix is a tiny little structure on the bottom right side of your abdomen. And the pain is emanating throughout the entire right-hand side of your abdomen. So if somebody's ever had appendicitis, it was like just pain coming from all, the whole lower right side of your abdomen. So it's not like you, most people are going to say, oh, that's my appendix. Most people don't know what it is. A good doctor, a good nurse will know immediately what it is because they know where the pain is perceived from these different internal organs. Now the question is, why does the pain feel like it's coming from the surface of the body rather than from the internal organ? We don't know for sure. Here's the theory. And since it's only a theory, I'm not going to emphasize it, but I'll mention it. The theory is this, and it's pictured, it's shown in this picture. Here it shows a pain sensory neuron coming from the skin. Here it shows a pain sensory neuron coming from an internal organ. This is a somatic noxiceptor. This is a visceral noxiceptor. But both of them are shown synapsing onto the very same spinal thalamic pathway. So either injury in the skin will cause a signal to go up to a specific part of uh, area in your primary sensory area of your brain, or injury to the internal organ will end up activating that very same, very same area in the primary sensory area of your brain. So your brain can't know for certain whether the injury is coming from the surface of your body or coming from an internal organ. Because either injury here or here would send a signal to the very same part of your cerebral cortex. Now, for the first 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of your life, where did you more commonly injure yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah. The surface of your body. Because part of life is we're always cutting ourselves, bruising ourselves, getting a little burn. Uh, bumping into something, we're always bumping and hurting the surface of our body. All right? Our internal organs, if mo for most of us, have really not caused us much problems. And that doesn't really start to happen until we're older in life. In other words, when people get myocardial ischemia, wh what causes the, uh, the lack of oxygen to your heart? Clogged up arteries to your heart atherosclerosis, right? <laughs> That's why they're on Lipitor. So you don't have, people don't have myocardial ischemia when they're 12 years old, when they're 20 years old, when they're 30 years old, even when they're 40 years old. They get clogged up arteries over many, many decades. So when there's 50 and 60 and 70 is when they're getting clogged up arteries to their heart, and their heart now, for the first time, is uh, uh, injured, and it's sending signals up to the brain. But the brain, for all these years, has always had these injuries coming from the surface of the body, like the shoulder. So the very same neural pathway that sends signals from the heart also sends signals from the shoulder. 
So when that area of the brain is activated, the brain goes, it's my shoulder again from conditioning. That's the theory. We think that uh, there's uh, simply your brain can't dis differentiate between whether the signal came from an internal organ or from the surface of your body in that same general area. You feel that pain in your shoulder. You feel the pain, in, but, but, the, and, but, uh, it, but it feels like it's coming from the shoulder, not the heart. Because the brain knows every time that this area of the brain's ever been activated, it's where you hurt your shoulder. We've all injured our shoulders, overstretched a muscle, did something, bumped our shoulder over and over again. But most of us have not experienced myocardial ischemia, an in, uh, 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 injury to our heart. Okay? And by the time that happens, your brain is so used to perceiving or creating a sensation and projecting it back to the surface of the body. You just feel it coming from the shoulder. That's it. That's exactly the point. The injury is in the heart. There's no injury in the shoulder, but the feels like it's coming from the shoulder. And what happens if it's a real injury in the shoulder? Well, that, well, normally that's what you do is you injure your shoulder, and the, that's what's injured, and it feels like it's injured. In this case, you feel an injury, an injured shoulder, and it's not your shoulder that's injured. It's your heart. That's called referred pain. Okay, our brain is fascinating.